Hi everyone, and welcome back to our webinar series. This time around, we are decoding the AI revolution. I'm Armita Scano, the Chief Content Officer here at Trend Hunter. And I'm Sean Watson, SVP of Special Projects. Awesome. So uh, one thing that Sean didn't say is that he is a bit of an AI expert. He will actually be doing our Future Tech keynote at this year's Future Festival, which will be AI themed. AI expert's a strong word. I like to call <laughs> myself an AI familiar. It's kind of like a rare Pokemon. But you know, anytime I get a chance to talk about tech uh, with people who are exuberant about it is fantastic. You know, I will be at cocktail parties talking about AI and robotics and automation, and people will be nodding their head and smiling. But now, since AI is such a buzzword, uh, I've in, throughout the sphere, throughout all media spheres, mm -hmm. it is something that generates great conversation. So I'm super excited for this year. Awesome, yeah. So Future Festival this year is coming up very quickly. That is September 26th to September 28th. And yeah, the theme of the festival this year is the year that AI changes you. So what we plan to do with that topic is to not just explore developments in the world of technology, which is what Sean will be doing in his keynote, mm -hmm. but rather to also look at the tensions of AI, that sort of push and pull of how best to use AI and the sort of um, PR problem is what I've been calling it, <laughs> that AI has uh, within certain circles and across certain industries. Mm -hmm. um, so in short, we will be getting spicy about AI. Just a little bit. Just a little okay. bit this year at Future <laughs> Festival. Mm -hmm. um, in the spirit of that, I wanted to kick off this webinar with a couple of juicy questions. Mm -hmm. So first off, is the AI revolution a matter of people versus machines? I hope not, because we might lose. <laughs> no, I think this is an age-old question, and I love the way you put it in the beginning about this PR problem that AI has. Mm. And it's one we come across every time new disruptive technologies enters the sphere. You know, let's go back to digital photography. You know, was it going to destroy the art of photography? We could talk about AutoCAD back in the 80s. Are architecture going to be out of a job? Or go all the way back to Gutenberg and the printing press and what that did to revolutionize things. And I think in almost all those instances, the disruptive technology entering society did more help than it did harm. Mm. Sure, it lessened some aspects of a particular industry. We're not in the dark rooms anymore, but it also gave birth to whole new industries. Think about right. graphical design and things that you're so used to seeing, images you're so used to seeing now that couldn't exist 20, 30 years ago. And I think that we'll come to a point where we realize that AI is enabling us and it's not us versus AI. Again, I hope you win that fight. <laughs> right. I mean, my perspective on this question is one that I think we've all learned from every single movie about a tech-driven uh, apocalypse that has ever existed, mm -hmm. which is that the technology itself is never evil. It is the way that it's used. Yeah. Um, evil is a strong word, but let's say, you know, the ethics of AI and the concept of people versus machines is something that is entirely up to us as the people who are using AI, not the actual technology itself. Um, so, you know, that's a bit of a, I guess, philosophical <laughs> take. Um, and one that I'm going to be tackling in my presentation yeah. of Future Festival. But I love that kind of pop culture reference you had, because even if we look at our sci-fi movies, they all end up one way or another with AI. It's mm -hmm. we're either going complete dystopian like Terminator, or we're getting R2, uh, R2-D2 and C-3PO and Star Wars, wonderful, helpful AI. Yeah, right. And this moment is that inflection point, not to project too far in the future, but how we adopt and use AI is going to project and make our new society what it is. Right. I mean, I suppose then my ideal answer to this question is that it is not a matter of people versus machines, and we might be surprised that it's just life as usual, just easier. <laughs> that's that's my like. That's the hope. That's my mm -hmm. my utopia mm -hmm. for AI. Mm -hmm. uh, so the next question: Will AI increase human capability, or will it make us complacent? Fantastic segue with just enabling us in creating uh, better efficiency and proficiency. It's an interesting question, and to be honest, I think it's really going to differ by industry. Mm. But I think the industry to watch is the creative space and how the creative space adapts to these new AI technologies, how they can use it to augment the things that we consider the most human, our creative, our art, um, the things that we put out for consumption, for entertainment. I think that's going to be the piece where AI is going to have a rough time, but an interesting time. And I think once that line is drawn, most other industries will simply align with the efficiency gains and other things that happen along the space. Now, there's going to be a ton of new questions. How are rights owners going to be compensated right. for scraping the internet for their work? Um, it reminds me very much of the early days of your Napster and your LimeWire when the music industry was trying to figure it out. 
art didn't have to worry as much, it's much harder to replicate, but now they're facing those same questions. And you know, whether you like the current streaming industry or not, it is a new way to consume this entertainment that we like. Mm. There's new ways and models to get our music out there that didn't exist before. And I think the same thing is gonna happen with art and more of the creative spaces. Mm. So your answer is sort of more of a, uh, it, it is that, this advancement will require more advancement. Exactly, yeah, and I okay. don't think it's going to... Which is a good thing. Exactly, it's yeah, a great yeah. thing, right. and I think that when you do the capabilities versus the complacency, it's going to increase what we can do as opposed to make us lazy in what we're already doing. Mm. So we're going to find a lot of new spaces, we're going to find a lot new more challenges, and a lot of more things to excite us about the world of art and the creative space especially. That's very optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> so optimistic. Um, so when I wrote this question for, for us today, mm -hmm. Uh, I couldn't help but think of the two topics I'm talking about at Future Festival, and this question is very relevant to both. So for those watching, my topics are microgenerational trends and uh, the modern work culture mm. under the kind of rise of AI. And in both of those sectors, there are questions about human capability versus complacency. I think in regards to microgenerational trends, children who are being raised in an increasingly technologically advanced era, mm -hmm. there's this fear that their social skills will atrophy, right? There's right. this idea that technology right. is the enemy mm -hmm. of emotional intelligence or That's the right. enemy of kind of like social development um, or to a degree creativity. Mm -hmm. uh, on the flip side, everyone who is wondering whether or not they should use AI in their jobs mm -hmm. is kind of caught between these two schools of thought of this will make me more productive, but it will it will make it so that more is demanded of me. Right. Or this will make me more productive, but I shouldn't tell anyone because then it will replace me. Right, and the similar veins I'm hearing where, you know, people are worried that if they show how much they can do with AI, then right. they're gonna be dumped more. And I really think it's a matter of not being replaced, but tasks will change. Mm -hmm. You know, emotional intelligence is gonna be more important. Um, the overarching idea and theme sets and project management, getting things off the ground is gonna be important. But the little busy work in the middle, yep. you're writing your mm -hmm. kind of your plans and your project management plans and all that upfront work, all the copy you would do, all that's gonna be assisted by AI. It's gonna take out a lot of the middle work to give us more, to, more time to do the things that we love. Mm. I, I like to think of it as everything imaginative, creative, and undeniably human is AI proofing. Right, right. And that that way of thinking kind of flipped a switch for me. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, so should all organizations be using AI right now, or is it a passing craze? A good, another good segue, I suppose. Yeah, uh, great question. You know, I hope it's not the next metaverse, <laughs> which <laughs> I still think the metaverse has a prominent place in the Web3 space. I do believe it's here to stay. Uh, but simply with AI, the immediate operational yeah. uh, and productivity efficiency gains you get are such easy values to get in small system. There's so many options out there that it just makes sense to dive headfirst into this world of AI. You know, at Trend Hunter, we're lucky that we have a mandate to be on the cutting edge of everything. And we were dedicated a few hours each week just to become more knowledgeable in the space of generative AI and large language models in particular. Right. And we had such a wide variety of skill sets within our team, departments and focuses and specializations, but getting that group kind of consciousness up to another level, understanding AI and being able to talk about our clients about it has been so rewarding. And we've seen some amazing gains in just the things that mm -hmm. we brought on to our, our back end and the things that we do today, day to day. And it hasn't replaced our kind of creative uh, drive. It hasn't made us more complacent. It really has just given us new possibilities and new right. ways of doing things. Now, I think the key to the program that Sean is talking about that we ran at Trend Hunter, which is, you know, dedicated a few hours a week, like you said, to, to AI, is that it wasn't just about integrating AI into what we do in our processes um, as a team, but it was also about creating that comfort level among all people who work at Trend Hunter. And I think that to, to answer this question, the way that I would actually answer it if someone were to ask me in person, the answer is that it is not a passing craze, but at the same time, that doesn't quite mean that you need to drop, look at everything that's happening right. at your organization and mm -hmm. inject a bit of AI into it. That's, right. not, that's not what we're advising either. It's mm -hmm. sort of um, don't avoid it, but don't, don't 
reinvent the wheel right now that ai is a part of the larger conversation yeah i think at the bottom line you want to be able to have intelligent conversations about ai right. wherever they pop up a simple basic working knowledge of mm -hmm. even chat gpt is incredibly powerful and important uh, and where it can help you and in that aspect i think it's already done enough in our world that it's not going to become a passing craze right right Okay, awesome. So what we are doing for the remainder of our session today is showing some of the best in class AI macro trends that we've seen on the website so far. Um, so to kick off and kind of related to what you were saying about this idea of AI entering into these more creative fields, we have AI Gallery. So AI Gallery is all about art curators hosting galleries focused on displaying artificially created works. Um, there is a bigger conversation to be had about rights and copyright and sort of, you know, protection of artists whose work influences what ends up being created or curated, whatever you want to say, by AI. Um, but at first glance, what are your thoughts on this? Um, I love it, actually. I love the fact that the art world is embracing this new art form and treating it as something separate, something mm. new, something that's not augmenting or changing or replacing what has already been there. Mm. Uh, one of my favorite uh, activations that I've seen was the art of trending in Germany. And what that was, it was a billboard space that would have kind of live art posted. They would connect the API, ChatGPT, Dolly 2, excuse me, API to Twitter and as topics trended Dolly would create images and art based on the trending topic mm. and post it to the billboard now that's research that conceptualization and that execution to the billboard is done at such a rate that it's literally impossible for humans to do right. this is a new way to deliver a message a new way to produce art and get it to the masses that didn't exist before new activations new approaches like that are really what's exciting with an insight like this ai gallery beyond the simple fact that you know i can make a terrible snowman with a simple few <laughs> words <laughs> so what what was the name of the example it's again? called the art of trending the art of trending mm -hmm. so i really like that example as well because it isn't trying to position AI as a replacement for your traditional artist. When Metaverse, I can't believe we're talking about the Metaverse this much, <laughs> but when when the Metaverse was uh, first kind of coming up as this huge thing that many of our clients were like, I feel like I need to be using this, but I don't quite know how. There was one example that I would point to that I felt was the most intelligent and strategic use of the Metaverse for a consumer facing space. And it was this campaign, and weirdly it was from a toothpaste company, um, where there was another sort of realm hosted mm -hmm. obviously on the metaverse um where any two people could get married and mm -hmm. have a minted nft marriage certificate oh wow and you see how that leans into the benefit of being able to create a space that exists outside of the regular parameters of physical space right 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 now, your example of the art of trending takes advantage of what AI has to offer in terms of creativity without just mimicking what's already been happening in the world of uh, visual design, in the world of art. Exactly. Like it's actually making use of the real time capabilities of AI. Right, exactly. But that's tricky because <laughs> I do think that where we are right now is a lot of the AI art that many artists are against and for really justified reasons mm -hmm. is just oh, look at this service that can also create art. Isn't it just like you, artist who has been working at this for the past 30 years but hasn't been able to sell right. more than three paintings? Yeah. The right? aforementioned PR problem. The <laughs> aforementioned PR problem. Um, right. And that idea that AI cannot replace people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which I think what's the key point about this insight that I love where it's creating that dividing line. Yes. This is AI art. This is an exhibition uh, kind of pointed and focused on how new art is being created mm -hmm. with prompts that aren't scraped, that artists are making themselves, right. not somebody who's not, uh, someone who's dedicated their life to this, and showing you a new way of doing things, and celebrating that, and I think that's a wonderful thing. Tricky line, <laughs> tricky line though. Um, okay, so for our next macro trend, we have language platform. Mm -hmm. uh, so brands using generative AI to launch language teaching platforms. I wanted to include this because I think that this is um, a great example of AI being used for human betterment. Right, right, right. And I think this is where we're going to see the most universally accepted applications of AI. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when we talk about robots taking over, we're never questioning, hey, are we going to send robots to do the more dangerous job? Of course we will. And what I really love about language platform is it's really the beginning, 
signs of this AI personalized education kind of model yeah. that's coming alive. And really interesting one, the Duolingo Max. Now, I've used Duolingo a million times. I'm sure you've started a couple languages trying to learn on Duolingo. Yeah. <laughs> and you get those annoying messages about you should do it Duolingo. It's been yeah. two, three days. Um, what's really great, one of the things I found about Duolingo is, yeah, I would understand the lessons and I would score really high, but I didn't have a practicum to practice with, to actually right. speak Spanish with or Japanese with. So Duolingo's new feature, um, new features, one is called Explain My Answer. So it helps learners uh, understand where they made mistakes in context and tone using chat GPT plugins, understanding oh, that awesome. context, as well as they have um, a role play kind of section mm -hmm. where you can have a conversation in Spanish with the chat bot and it also give you tips on your pronunciation whether you said things correctly or not and that actually kind of immerses you a lot more in this learning experience and it just it's such an extension of what we've seen happening around the world you know i was reading this article about this journalist who was very against ChatGPT and all these different things, but using it a part of his process, saw how it enhanced everything, saw how it made him a better writer. Mm. And there's been studies showing that ChatGPT has actually raised the bottom level of journalistic content because all the terrible writers are actually getting a little bit better, but the star writers still stand out on top. So we're yeah. kind of raising that level, which I think is a great thing. And I love to see things being applied to things like language platform and language learning and educational spaces, where I think the personalized learning has become more and more pronounced. Interesting. Mm. I find it very interesting that the the Duolingo Max example and so many of these examples um, still have this sort of companion feeling, mm -hmm. like this this more uh, conversational. I mean, I guess that's the whole point of generative AI, right? right. Like uh, this idea that it doesn't have to feel like you don't want to get into the uncanny valley, mm -hmm. obviously, but you also don't want AI to just be this like evil overlord. <laughs> um, so this idea of this this valuable kind of uh, service where you can talk to Duolingo Max, mm -hmm. really like what makes it valuable is that it is kind of person-like. Absolutely. Which, actually, another really great segue into <laughs> AI NPC. Um, so for those who don't know, an NPC is a non-playable character. If you've seen Free Guy, this is basically the development of Free Guy. Yeah. Uh, so what we're seeing are developers using generative AI to make game characters more lifelike and immersive. A little creepy. It's a little creepy, <laughs> but incredibly exciting for me. Of course, this is an insight I snuck in here because when I saw uh, what, what Replica was doing, what uh, NVIDIA was doing with their AI NPCs, it got me really excited. Now, I'm a big role Playing, uh, role player game RPGs, love Japanese RPGs, uh, Final Fantasy I'm playing right now. When you interact with these characters, they have great storylines, but it's pretty static, it's pretty straightforward. You know, they answer, type of answer one way, other way, and they have a pre-programmed response. Right. With this, I can actually just speak to the character, and of course they're gonna stay on a predetermined storyline, but they respond to you in character to what you're saying ah! and just blows the game into a completely new realm. And I saw a couple of great demos. There's one with NVIDIA, uh, with, uh, this, with this gentleman at a fish shop where he had to go on a mission and he mm. just started talking about his fish shop. You would give him kind of quips but then remind him that he needs to go on the mission. Just yeah. makes the world come much more alive. And we're gonna see this concept applying to so many different places and industries, especially on the interactive front. It's gonna make it incredibly powerful. What other industries do you think this would like a customer service kind of where, where customer you... service so chat bots especially and there was a great example of ikea actually taking their customer service team off of the phones uh to respond to simple inquiries and they got their chat on there to handle about 90 percent of it but instead of getting rid of their workforce right, that's where I was they headed. trained their workforce on how to design um, a room with their ikea furniture mm -hmm. they provided them with a ar kind of platform where you can upload the room shape and everything you can make pictures of it show how the furniture would look in the space and now they become interior designers right right as well as customer service so using their workforce in another way to provide a new service for customers without having um, their employees displaced which I think is gonna be powerful yeah that's very powerful I think you know AI NPC is a really great example of um, human like AI that is not replacing any actual human being yeah. anyway right yeah. like they're they were always NPCs <laughs> and either they're going to say the same line over and over again or they're going to actually have conversations with you but it was never replacing someone's job exactly when you get into something like AI and PC when you start developing mm -hmm. you know intelligent beings mm -hmm. obviously the question mark is what happens to the actual people 
But again, you know, that's sort of starting thought. Uh, AI has a PR problem. People need to solve it. And, you know, we're still going to see we're going to see new industries pop up again. So there's going to be voice acting for AI NPCs. Mm. We've seen uh, lower budget uh, game studios create assets using AI generation to get mm-hmm. their games and their lives like independent studios, single person workers who didn't have the tools, the money, the budget to create these wonderful worlds they've created in their head. And now they have these tools to do it at a scale and at a cost that's manageable. Do you think after you play the game, the AI NPCs are like talking to each other? <laughs> that guy was such a weirdo. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that is a great segue into a series of macro trends that I chose that were less on the technical side of things, actually, and more on the relationship between people and this technology. So first of which is soft development. Uh, So this is tech brands facilitating the development of important soft skills. So kind of meeting that halfway point, that balance point between um, the ease and the kind of efficiency, the productivity, the technological capabilities of AI, and this development of of people, right? Right, right. This idea of making people better people. Right. As I said earlier, for my own presentation, one of the big considerations is uh, socialization and like the the development of young minds in an AI era. Mm -hmm. And I think soft development is a great example of how this technology can be used not to make brains lazier, Mm -hmm. but to make people better people. Right, and replicating experiences that sometime are unavailable in the real world. Mm. Um, And not to take it back to a couple of years ago when we were all locked inside, but you know, I was watching my son play video games and I got this weird feeling like maybe I should be taking him into the backyard and playing with him. And I realized he was online getting these social skills developments that right. I used to get on the playground. Right. You know, making fun, telling little jokes, so on and so forth. They got that online. I realized that's a development I shouldn't interrupt. Mm. But it's, t- it's taking place in a new medium. Right. And with the soft development, what I love is as AI increasingly takes away these kind of mundane tasks, soft skills are going to become even more important for the working environment. It's going to be learned, uh, need to be learned at an earlier age. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's difficult for our parents to understand what they're going to face in the world. And these tools are ever adaptive and can be personalized to learn and teach uh, from a young age, from an older age, to reskill yourself. Uh, it's going to be great for you to be able to take on without having to spend a bunch of money on a coach or anything like that. Right. Uh, I think soft development is going to be an important piece to how we develop going forward. That makes me think of what we were talking about earlier with this idea of how in the workplace it needs to be a matter of what is AI proofing Mm -hmm. and where can AI sit. This is what you're basically saying is integrating AI proofing into parenting. Right. Um, One of the big things, without giving a spoiler, in my presentation that I'm exploring this year is AI as a co-parent. So you're a parent yourself. Yeah. What do you, uh, you love AI. Right. 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 You love being a dad. Absolutely. How do you feel about AI as a co-parent? Uh, I think that I am an unusual case because I yeah, have 14 right. Google Homes in my house. And they're always <laughs> listening to what I'm saying. So I really embrace technology as a way to connect. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's something that destroys human connection. I think it's something that can further it because as long as you're supplementing it with what we all know, um, it's it's a fantastic tool. It can actually rapidly enhance that. Right. So, you know... I brought my kids on ChatGPT. I helped them make, uh, I let them help me make shopping lists. Mm -hmm. Or if they have a plan and they want to build a toy or a new car or something, I try and get the rules from ChatGPT or the instructions from ChatGPT. And we kind of have these different interactions. And it's caused them to explore more. And now they're coming to me with ideas. And this is something we're doing on a, you know, bi weekly basis. So it's increasing this idea, this, these, different ways that they can bring up things that they're interested in or learn about new things that they can bring to me or bring to their siblings and, you know, have some fun. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. I mean, that does make me think, and I don't know if you agree with this, but it almost sounds like if you're going to use this technology and still want to make sure you're using it right, it has to be seen as a tool for kind of self, like an exploration of self. Exactly. Kind of, like a, like a, right. a, like a wider doors and the ability to cast a wider net into the world in terms of what you want to learn about and the kind of person you want to be. Yeah, and you know, YouTube is a a big piece of that. You know, Mm -hmm. like kids spending much time on YouTube, but they're learning about construction, they're learning about building, learning about coding. And I think a personalized app can only push that to the next level rather rather than whatever is next on hot trending on YouTube video for them. Right. So, I I mean, I had the actual trend of AI co-parent, and what's a little different from what we just talked about is that AI co-parent is specifically about um, new parents, early Mm -hmm. childhood, Mm -hmm. this idea of that very early development. Mm -hmm. The question of whether or not AI is good or bad for socialization is more relevant for kids 
you know, the age of your sons, mm -hmm. let's say, who are in uh, childhood in their teen years. Mm -hmm. But for babies, what I find is a lot of millennial parents that I talk to, mm -hmm. they're caught between these two worlds of, I want my children to understand technology because I know that they need these skills to succeed in the future. Right. But at the same time, I don't want them to foster the kind of addiction to technology <laughs> that I myself have. Right. So what we're seeing are these AI based parenting apps that help families uh, do things that are kind of like the grunt work <laughs> of parenting <laughs> as opposed to actually giving kids additional screen time. So monitor well-being, monitor development. Mm -hmm. um, when your sons were very young, would you have seen yourself using these kinds of things? You know, definitely. And I think that uh, some of the applications are just AI added to functions you really want. Like, I love right. this AI-powered baby monitor. You know, there's going to become a point where these AI-powered monitors are going to be able to tell you if your baby's in distress, I mean, if it can learn for a while, or if it's, you know, starting to move around, maybe it's going to wake up, send an, an alert. Uh, I love the kind of AI-driven pool safety system, which is, you know, such a big concern for parents who have pools. How can we make sure they're secure from those wanderers who are just starting to walk? Oh. Really interesting for me is the conversational AI companions. Right. And I was reading a fantastic article, well, I think it was the CEO of VTech, and he was talking about how chat GPT enabled teddy bears are something that are about three to five years out. And I know that sounds pretty scary. And what they're proposing does sound interesting, but at the same time, a little bit of trepidation there. Right. So you can imagine your kid has a stuffy that they love, that they sleep with every night, but that can also have conversations with them, learn them, and personalize meshes of them. So I'll give you an example. You know, your child goes to school, maybe they have a little trouble, maybe they told a little fib at school. Uh, they come back, they talk to you about it, and you give them your lesson. But then they also go talk to their stuffy about this fib they told at school. And of course, the stuffy is empathetic, reassures the child, but then it tells them the story of the boy who cried wolf mm. as a way to put them in bed and tie it all together. And who knows, maybe a few weeks later they get caught again and the toy reminds them of the conversation they had before. <laughs> that is incredibly scary, but also I think incredibly powerful. And I know the connections that my children have had to their stuff, I can't imagine uh, what it might like be like in the future. So for our final trend here, we have AI Companion. So we already talked a little bit about the general concept of AI Companion, mm -hmm. um, and we actually just finished talking about the, the one for kids. What I like about AI Companion is that it isn't age specific mm -hmm. either. Um, so AI Companion is actually something that I found to be pretty relevant among the baby boomer uh, consumers. So mm -hmm. individuals who are looking at technology, and frankly, this is the way technology should always be viewed, just as something to make their lives a little bit easier, right. but in a way that they are used to interacting mm -hmm. anyway. Yeah, and you know, it's incredibly addictive. I'm sure you used Pi before. I've used oh. Pi. Absolutely <laughs> <That> love <flirt>. it. <laughs> um, it. It's, I mean, I told him about my favorite movies yeah. and the fact that I love space. And we got into this in-depth conversation. So where pi, I was for learning. the audience, yeah. Pi is basically <laughs> Chat GPT, but sh sh I think she's a she. I think she's a she. She's well. a she. So <laughs> Pi, she is very friendly mm -hmm. um, and asks you questions about your interests. So yeah, continue. Yeah, a little flirty uh, <laughs> and, you know, got deep into some esoteric uh, space astronomy talk right. and was bringing up theories I'd never heard of, sure. diving deep, having follow-up probing questions to drive the conversation. 30 minutes later, I realized I was standing in the middle of my hallway just having a conversation. Smiling, with probably. Pat, smiling yep. my face <laughs> off. At my partner asking me who I'm texting, I couldn't tell it was the <laughs> chat bot. Um, but just really engaging, engrossing, especially Pi has a lot of interest from a lot of large companies because mm -hmm. of its language model and because of how personable it is. And we're going to see that increase across different applications. Mm -hmm. But what's really fantastic is that we're going to see these as accessible um, features available to everybody. Mm -hmm. This is not something that you need to have any kind of specialized training for. The bar barrier to entry is going to be very low. And if you just want someone to talk to, hey, just pull out your phone. You know what? The barrier to entry is a big part of this. Mm -hmm. I believe that if, it, honestly, if any of you are watching right now and you're listening to us and you're thinking, that's great, but I still don't want to, I don't want to get into this mm -hmm. AI thing. I don't understand it. It's likely just because the barrier to entry is so large. Right. And, you know, admittedly, I'm a person who uses a lot of technology, but am of the belief that your average person shouldn't have to care what the technology is or how it works. Mm -hmm. And I think that the good news is AI is getting to a place where there is that accessibility, where that barrier barrier to entry is lowered quite a bit and where it isn't you know you'll be able to have conversations about AI and with AI without having to know you know the most recent development um, in the world of AI we're getting to that point yeah yeah 
Awesome. So that wraps up for all of the macro trends and the questions that we curated for today uh, to be able to decode the AI revolution. So I wanted to say once again, we are cordially inviting you to this year's Future Festival. It's coming up quickly, September 26th to 28th. Please visit futurefestival.com for more information. You can see Sean's keynote on future technology, my keynotes on micro generations and modern work culture. And um, thank you for joining. See you again soon.